Price has always been an important factor during the search shop buy process, but new technologies and the proliferation of mobile devices are shedding new light on pricing strategies. This untethered planning process has changed travel behavior, giving new significance to the role of pricing in travel decisions. As a result, dynamic pricing is becoming mainstream. Welcome to Being Competitive in a World of Dynamic Pricing, sponsored by Rate Gain. My name is Lorraine Cilio, and I'll be your moderator. Today you'll hear from Focus Right Senior Technology Analyst Norm Rose, who will discuss how traveler tech behavior and technology trends are creating the foundation for dynamic pricing. Norm will be joined by Rate Gain's founder and CEO, Banu Chopra, who will discuss specific pricing trends in a competitive environment. The format will consist of 35-minute presentation, followed by 10-minute Q&A. However, we'll be taking questions throughout the entire event and at the end, so please use your question mark icon that's at the bottom right side of your screen and send your questions to all panelists. You may also click the bottom left-hand box with the arrow if you'd like to go into full screen mode. So Norm, what are some of the trends that are taking the industry toward dynamic pricing? Well, that's what we're going to be discussing. So thank you for that great introduction, Lorraine. Uh, we're going to look at a number of different areas, some focus right research around consumer behaviors, uh, an overall kind of check-in as, as far as the pace of technological change, uh, the impact of mobile on the planning and shopping and buying process, uh, the role that big data plays within this context of dynamic bundling, dynamic pricing, uh, just a brief discussion around social media's influence, and then we'll talk about dynamic bundling uh, specifically as it relates to ancillary types of services with a summary at the end. So why look at all these different areas and why look at consumer research? I mean, we're going to find that some of the consumer research is pretty consistent over the last few years, uh, but we'd like to just reinforce that some of the patterns that we've seen in the past, the number of websites that uh, different uh, travelers look at in the planning stage, those are things that really influence the way that the buying and the dreaming, the buying, the shopping, pr uh, purchasing of travel. Uh, the reason to look at emerging technologies as people shift platforms, especially with the emergence of mobile, not only in the form of a smartphone, but also of a tablet, there are this, this untethering process, as, as Lorraine was describing, where you can really plan and dream and plan and book any place, any time. Uh, and as a result, that's changing the dynamics of uh, pricing. And the idea that we're actually in a mode where pricing could be unique is also part of a bigger trend of personalization. And it's really designed to increase customer loyalty, as I mentioned here, get a greater share of, of the customer wallet, and is spreading throughout the travel industry ecosystem as a real major trend. So let's begin with just a discussion around consumer behavioral trends. So there's no real uh, big surprise here when we just asked in our survey uh, which are the uh, when you take trips in the past year, you know, how many were for different types of purposes, that choosing a destination was independent for a, a good almost 50%, a little less than 50% of the attendees. The other big group, obviously, is fa family and friends visiting, not necessarily a social event. And then we get into the social events of weddings and extending business trips and so forth. So the message here really is that this independent destination choice uh, and visits to friends still dominate. I think the most important element in relationship to dynamic pricing is destination choice. There are tools that are out there that are specifically designed to help travelers look at comparative destinations. So that you may enter in things like, I want a beach vacation, and you could compare a beach location somewhere in the Bahamas versus going to Hawaii. So I think destination is being paired with technology here which really ends up, uh, again, another factor increasing the amount of planning that's done. And then uh, the motivation, just drilling down that independently selected destination. Why do people go? This is a tremendous shock to everyone. People want to get away. 
And it just reinforces, I think we all live in a society and an environment, no matter where you live in the world, where it's pretty fast fate, but pretty fast paced, excuse me, and very much driven by always connected activities. So getting away on vacation is obviously a big motivation. But this, this next slide where we talk about the number of websites used in, during the travel planning process phase is, I think, very, very important. If you look at it, it's not much of an increase, but it's pretty consistent where you look at just the purple, which is 3 to 4, and the blue, 5 to 6, and the plus 7, represents the majority, uh, you know, about 63% um, of people looking at least three to four websites, and some still look at one to two. And the number of web websites, as, we, as I've indicated, hasn't changed a lot in 2010, 2011, 2012, but the fact that people are shopping and really trying to determine what is the best destination but also what's the best value is a very important element of this. That's, re that's really reinforced by this uh, graphic here, where if you look very, very candidly, why are people looking at these various websites? When planning travel, I always check multiple websites to make sure I'm getting a good deal. So we obviously have had a, a whole change in role from the consumer's viewpoint. Not saying that for as long as people have been traveling, they don't want a good deal. But the level of transparency really has become to the point where they know if they keep on shopping, they may find something better. And so really, price comparison is the driver of that multi-web shopping more than anything else. I mean, there's some vacation planning and destination inquiries and things like that as well, but price continues to be the main driver as far as multiple uh, comparison websites. And where are people going? Well, primarily they're going to OTAs. And number two now is they're actually just using general search, such as Yahoo or Google, uh, and then sometimes travel supplier sites, and then MetaSearch. And I think the important statistic, uh, st stat here, if you look at 2012, 36 percent from 33 and 28 percent before for the meta search like kayak or fly.com and we've seen this on the number of facets of focus right research that people are starting to really embrace meta search as an alternative and depending on how that is done that certainly uh, is driven partially by trying to find that best deal And then I just want to focus on lodging for a moment. Where are people buying their, their hotel or lodging for a trip? And you can see that it's pretty much dominated by the OTAs, but the su supplier websites are also there growing a bit from 24 to 27. And, but again, 33%, I think what's the drop that we see probably, as you can tell, is call visiting a retail travel agent, which is moving from 5% down to 3% for the 2012 period. So obviously, uh, more and more shopping is happening, less uh, really calling or visiting a, real, uh, a um, retail travel agent. Uh, and this is a U.S. perspective only, by the way. I think that what we find when we look at a global perspective, there's still plenty of use of travel agents around the world. Uh, so I didn't mean to imply that they're going away based on this, but based on the, U uh, the U.S. Uh, kind of interactions, it seems to be dropping a bit. Let's move on to the technology that's influencing this process as we get to really the, the, the final discussion around dynamic pricing and dynamic bundling. Well, you know, these, this, this change that's happened certainly initially as the Internet became popular, what it really did is a level of transparency. Rather than being at a retail travel agent, having them look at some computer and saying, hmm, I wonder what is behind that screen, we're now in an environment that Really, there is transparent pricing throughout the industry. Um, social has obviously grown as impacting the selection, everything from uh, aggregate reviews like TripAdvisor to individual planning tools that maybe access your social network through Facebook. And then that all has been combined social, local, and mobile in this phrase called solo mo, which really means that we ha now have an environment where Travelers are always connected. Whether they're going to be like in this diagram, uh, snorkeling and looking at their pad, I don't know. But <laughs> certainly there is this constant connectivity. 
And where are we going relative to technology? Well, we're going to everything from wearables like watches and glasses to computers that do all sorts of sensing for you to actually having not the way Siri is today or Google Now is today, but really moving to true intelligent assistance. You know? And as we get to that type of environment where there's sensing and intelligent assistance and even multiple devices hooked into some type of central personal uh, Wi-Fi hub, this becomes more of a challenge because now you have a real personal platform where pricing can be targeted. It's getting smaller, more mobile, and smarter. And in particular, when we talk about the life cycle, and the life cycle can be described in different ways in this slide, it's dream, plan, book, explore, and share. And I think we all know that share kind of permeates everything now, including you know, the dream and plan stage through social networking. But the, the key message here is that the tablet and the smartphone are really impacting the dream plan and book stages. So you may be sitting in a doctor's office, you may be on a train, you may be on your couch, or you know you may be in a car, which actually happened to my family where my wife was using the tablet to plan a vacation to Europe while we were going up to visit my son in college. So any place, any time, and what it does is extends this dreaming, planning, and booking cycle. So there's a lot more information. And therefore, the search based on price becomes very, very important for most travelers. Booking as well is starting to really take off, moving from just a, a kind of share of total market in 2013. Focus right is predicting 12%, and this is U.S. as well, not global. But I think this shows, if you look at 4 to 12 just over a couple of years, there's going to be increased use of mobile for booking. There is already, though, increased use of mobile, whether it's smartphones or tablets, for planning. And when we're talking about rate parity or dynamic pricing, this is really the platform that people are using in order to check this. And as things accelerate, there's going to be even more of a move towards you know, using a device for booking. So there is this concept of big data, and we've heard it a lot, and a lot of people feel like it's just a buzzword. It really doesn't have meaning. There are many vendors out there who say they have big data. They really don't. But what does it really mean in reference to this whole idea of dynamic pricing, dynamic bundling? Well, the idea of defining big data, just very kind of simply, is big data means lots of uh, bytes, not just gigabytes, but uh, petabytes and beyond, so a huge amount of information. A lot of it ends up being unstructured, and uh, we certainly know some of the issues relative to unstructured, unstructured data within the travel context, but this sometimes includes things like social media, so being able to bring that together. And then the idea that traditional database tools, SQL queries, don't necessarily work in a big data environment. It's difficult to handle or process. And in fact, truly, big data often requires a travel scientist, someone who really, or a data, a data scientist, someone who really understands the types of things that need to be created, the types of queries that need to be created. The other element of big data, which is interesting, is that it could be a layer on top of multiple data, databases. So we've obviously all thought about uh, travel warehouses. Many vendors have massive travel warehouses of data around customers and so forth. But this big data interpretation is saying we're going to leave data in all these individual places and we're going to grab it just in real time and analyze it uh, and be able to deliver action on it. And so what we're saying is you take the big data, you combine that with software tools, some of them maybe even human-driven software tools for you know, really uh, data scientists, and what you're, you're yielding is business intelligence. But it's not business intelligence as let me run a report or business intelligence, let me look at my dashboard and see what's happening. That's old technology. Business intelligence applied to the travel uh, process, the buying, shopping, and evaluating price is part of this. And what's happening is as we see this applied to really um, travel in particular, but all types of shopping, there's a new kind of shopping intelligence that has emerged. And that includes understanding the type of shopper and really being able to understand their particular context of what they are looking for at that moment. A shopper profile 
it's not just, say, a GDS profile, as we've used for PNRs for years, but truly a robust profile that allows uh, the uh, vendor, in this case, or the intermediary, to understand a lot about that customer. Now, that may include implicit information that have been given to the vendor by the customer, or it could be ex uh, excuse me, uh, explicit, uh, explicit information is given by the traveler to the customer. The implicit is more about the behavior. What are they doing on the web? What do they click on? How are they behaving on the mobile device? And then from that, the idea of looking at booking patterns and ultimately the goal of big data applied to shopping intelligence is to try to improve that lifetime customer value, or another term that's commonly used, the share of customer wallet, but really looking at that customer. And so if you think of big data as one important tool set that vendors are using to shape a new world of dynamic pricing, I think that this becomes very, very clear. It can also measure things like campaign effectiveness and staffing. So when we look uh, at the industry, obviously there's been a lot of debate and concern around things like uh, NDC, which is the XML standard that the airlines have introduced. But the idea around ancillaries is definitely part of this dynamic pricing thought. So of course everyone's aware that we've shifted from you know, charging for free services to value-add services. And it's really more than just now charging for bags, as airlines do, but actually trying to have some value associated with the ancillary, early boarding, better seat pitch, maybe Wi-Fi on board, things like that. Um, and the idea, though, as it's been said by many, is the unbundling had to occur, so a rebundling uh, or a new bundling now has emerged. And it could be a combination of amenities and ancillary uh, services, or it could just simply be a unique price based on customer value. And it's not being only embraced by the airlines. This is something that's spreading across the industries, including uh, the hotel sector, looking at how they can take ancillaries to not only you know, generate additional revenue, but perhaps combine based on the profile of the customer through uh, information gathered through big data. Now, the social graph also has bearing here. And uh, we have seen, certainly, uh, as you're probably aware, I work with Bob Offit to chair the Travel Innovation Summit for Focusrite. And we've seen for the last three or four years applicants coming up with social graph-driven types of um, applications. And almost 9 out of 10, it's all around the planning process. So understanding where that influence exists out in the social community and tying that in as another point of, of data reference is very, very important. So what am I saying outright relative to dynamic pricing and dynamic bundling? Is depending upon your level of influence within your own social graph, as more and more tools emerge to kind of analyze that, that may play into the type of price or at least the type of bundled offers you receive in order to influence a greater share of your purchase and ultimately to help you influence others. And that's where we're really going to kind of drive personalization through some type of unique bundling as well as understanding where the uh, traveler has influence. So just to summarize before we move on with, with uh, the rate gain presentation and we open up things for Q&A, we know that consumers shop multiple sites. That has been a fact of the travel industry ever since the Internet took off. But more importantly, they're doing this because they want to make sure they get the re best deal. And obviously, there's a whole spectrum of people, some who are so driven by $2 savings through a channel, others only if it's very significant. But the idea that price is still on the mind of travelers, particularly leisure and managed. And I would tell you on the corporate world, even though the stats we reviewed don't really correspond to corporate travel, what we're finding cor is that corporates are just as uh, prone to shopping and trying to find the best deal within the context of the corporate policy and their own business goals relative to whatever the reason is for that business trip. From the consumer viewpoint, we see the shopping of OTAs. We see a growth of general search. And most importantly, the meta search piece is growing. And if you think about it, 
if I am doing multiple site comparisons and now I discover a kayak or a fly.com or a TripAdvisor meta search engine, that I can look at multiple sites through one query, it just is pretty obvious why the, the traveling community, the consumers, have gravitated towards meta search. It makes a single entry into a multiple price comparison, which, uh, you know, from a supplier viewpoint, is not necessarily what's what's preferred because every supplier, airlines included, want to try to differentiate their product. They don't want to be thought as a commodity that's only basically being viewed as a price comparison. The reality is that's the fact of shopping, that's the fact of consumer behavior, and the OTAs and supplier sites uh, and through meta search need to kind of be aware of that and make sure they're competitive. And the fact that we just look at hotels as a segment, the OTAs are still very strong with hotels, and as everyone on the phone knows is that it's a major driver for profitability for the, the hotel community, and whether it's independent hotels or chain hotels, uh, the idea that uh, you know this is sold through multiple channels. There's some love and hate uh, mixtures for the way they they work with the OTAs, but OTAs are a fact that that you know these companies aren't going to go away. They're just getting stronger. So therefore, you know the lodging purchase through those sites is significant for any hotelier. And as we look at technology, we recognize that technology is not a static thing. And, the real purpose of that graph I showed a little bit earlier is just to reinforce how fast things are coming. I mean, if you think about it, it was 2008 that the iPhone was introduced, 2010 that the iPad was introduced. And now you go any place in the world and you see people with pads, you see people with smartphones. And often what happens from a global perspective is that these devices, particularly tablets and smartphones, are doing kind of a leapfrog uh, effect around wor uh, the world where in some countries that are, have an emerging middle class, this becomes their primary device, and they're not purchasing desktops or laptops. In fact, the stats are showing the, uh, a significant decrease in laptop purchase overall worldwide. So this technology change is happening faster. So as the technology, and uh, mobile in particular, extends the cycle to dream and shop and book so it can be any place, anywhere, that's going to put more and more pressure on the different channels to make sure their price is competitive. And booking is as well part of that process that's really catching on. Though our numbers looked at U.S. research that we've done in other areas mirrors this. Uh, and we've seen tremendous mobile booking happening in China, for instance. So there's a, really a worldwide phenomenon around mobile and booking. But of course, mobile planning and dreaming has been happening right along. The idea that big data itself is an important element of this, it's not just the buzzword. It's the idea of really developing insight around what that customer's preferences and needs are so that once you have that as part of the shopping cycle, you have a much more personalized offer. And you know there is this possibility that offer may be so unique that only that individual receives that. We haven't gotten to that point yet. But that's definitely where the market is moving. And it's part of this whole merchandising element as well, the fact that we have merchandising uh, efforts to bundle anc ancillary services and dr drive really unique offers. So it's been uh, two, twofold here. Really what we see today is more what is termed fair families on the airline side so that you know for this price you can get uh, preferred seating, early boarding, Wi-Fi, perhaps a meal, and for the other uh, other side of the spectrum, for a lower price, you have to pay for everything, including your bag. So I think that that is the first manifestation that we've seen of, of merchandising. There's a whole group of platforms the airlines are using, ranging from Fair Logix to Google ITA software to Datalex, among just three that I've named, but there's others out there, in order to develop merchandising strategies and deliver unique bundled content based on the value of the customer. There's also a larger kind of airline effort to do customer experience management, which means to gather information at every touch point that the customer has and then deliver unique services at every touch point. That's a dream at this point or a long-range goal. We don't see anyone really doing that today, but it's part of this merchandising effort by the airlines, and it's spreading across the hotels as well as other channels. And we can't forget about the social graph. Whether you believe Facebook is on its way down, or on its way up, or Twitter is, 
it doesn't make a difference whether it is a particular platform. It's a phenomenon that's not going to it's not going to go away. In fact, from a kind of generational viewpoint, if you look at millennials or even below millennials, the dependence and and kind of checking with their social graph. Uh, friends and family is such a part of their life that it's just ingrained in their behavior, and obviously that's affecting the way that uh, individuals look around travel choices, whether it's dreaming, planning, or booking. So that concludes uh, my my portion. I'm going to just turn it back over to Lorraine for the rest of this webinar. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Norm. And you know, clearly, pricing is more complex than ever because of all the because technology providing so many options, you, know, you mentioned you know, targeting, personalization, merchandising, social, I mean, the list goes on. So obviously the next step, and I think this is a perfect seg segue for our next speaker, is what kind of solutions are out there. So I'd like to introduce Ray Gaines, CEO, Abanu Chopra, who's going to give his perspective on competitive pricing strategies and technology solutions. Banu? Thank you, Lorraine. Um, as Lorraine introduced, I'm the founder and CEO of Raytheon. So I thought I'll spend just a minute talking about Raytheon, introduce you guys to Raytheon, and then talk about some of the pricing trends that we see, and then talk about some of the investments we are making in helping our customers on how they price. So quickly, very quickly about Raytheon. Uh, we were formed in 2004. We have about 400 staff members. And we've had some very, very strong growth over the past three years. We've been growing over 50% year on year. Um, in terms of our global reach, we are uh, headquartered out of New Delhi, India, the NCR region. But, you know, we believe in being local wherever we operate. So we have regional offices in pretty much everywhere we operate. So our focus is to actually uh, provide solutions based on the, the cloud model. So our subscription model uh, allows customers to use our data to know how competitive they are in the marketplace. So one of the you know, big things that we do is provide comparison technology to different players in the travel ecosystem to know where they lie in the competitive landscape. So as Norm indicated a lot of the shoppers are actually going on multiple sites and shopping for the best deal. What we do is actually provide this technology to our customers for them to be able to see are they truly offering the best price. And a lot of our customers actually use this technology in their search campaigns and how they optimize their PPC campaigns. So in terms of the data that we collect, we're collecting over a billion and a half price points on a daily basis, which gets us about 20 billion price points on an annual basis. So we serve all the top OTAs, car rental companies, and hotel chains. And uh, we've been recognized for the fast growth that we've had. Deloitte recognized us as the fastest 50 technology companies out of India, fastest 500 in Asia. We were also finalists on red heading and similarly have been recognized by other, other bodies. So given uh, the amount of information that we collect, I thought I'll talk about some of the trends that we see. Um, so one of the trends that we see is, you know, based on different geographies, who's sort of the most competitive ODA? So I think if you look at North America and Europe, you would sort, sort of find the obvious choices. But what we find is that if you go into, you know, some of the other regions like India and China and Middle East, there are a lot of regional OTAs that have a strong hold and are fairly competitive. So, you know, in India, you have the Make My Trip, a Clear Trip and Yatra, which are fairly competitive. In Japan, you have Rakuten and Jalan, and in China, you have QNR, Elong, and C-Trip that are extremely effective in the kind of deals that they offer to the consumers. One of the other pricing trends that we looked at is how do these prices change as you approach the check-in date? 
And what we found is very, very interesting is that, you know, in the mature markets like Europe and North America, you tend to see as you approach the check-in date, the prices tend to rise. Whereas, you know, in maybe not so mature markets like the Middle East, you know, the prices tend to stay stagnant as you approach the check-in. So, you know, based on some sample data that we picked, we actually just saw a growth rate of 3% over the pricing um, over, a, over a period of time. Whereas with the U.S., we saw a 12% incremental lift as you approach the check-in date. Um, there was a, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, what mobile is doing and, you know, what mobile is doing specifically in terms of pricing. So we looked at a lot of that data as well, and we found that, you know, the OTAs in terms of the pricing that they have on their own site versus the mobile version, there wasn't any differential there. But when we compared the OTA rates versus, you know, the new age mobile apps like Hotel Tonight and Blink Booking, there was a notable difference in pricing. In fact, 83% of the time, the traditional ODA side seemed more expensive than what you had on the mobile. Uh, although uh, mobile sites like Hotel Tonight only curate the content and personalize it to the consumer, so it's not for all hotels, but whatever hotels we found on the mobile site were, were significantly cheaper. In fact, they were 25% cheaper than the ODA counterpart. What I want to do now is actually talk about, you know, some of the investments we are making and how we help our customers and how they they price their products, especially hotels. So we've come up with this product called RevGain, which basically takes into account the perceived value that consumers put on on a hotel, and this is basically largely dependent on the review scores that a hotel gets on you know, sites like TripAdvisor and all the other review sites. So we take a look at that. We look, take a look at what is the competitive information. Uh, we took at, take a look at the market supply uh, constraint and then based on that, make a recommendation on what price should the hotel price their product. So basically, the, the idea behind RevGain is to help understand the impact of social media scores on, and what they do on pricing. And I think there's been a lot of research that's done on it already. Uh, for instance, Cornell suggests that if the review scores go up by a point, there is an opportunity for a hotel to increase its price by almost 11%. And, and I want to hand it back now to Lorraine. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Varu. So I want to remind everyone to please use the Q&A icon if you have a question and to send it to all presenters. Now, we have quite a few questions. You know, and, you know, Bonnie, you really, you know, you hit on it because in the hospitality industry, particularly the impact of mobile, and you talked about how a mobile rates on, like, Hotel Tonight would be so much lower. So. If I'm a hotelier naturally, or really any supplier, I'm, you know, I have that question of like, how does my pricing strategy now differ, or how should it differ depending on platform? You know, whether it's the tablet, whether it's mobile, whether it's desktop. And you know, I guess that would be the first question, and then the follow-up would be, you know, are we changing patterns actually, trying, you know, changing behavior uh, due to some of this uh, unique you know, pricing based on the uh, device used? So, Yabani, know, do you want to start on that and then Norm, you know, jump in? Sure. So, Lorraine, I think uh, there is a position that these new mobile apps are playing in, and I think it's in the last minute impulse buying, you know, landscape. And I think it's an important area for, you know, for, for new players to come in and address. And I think it's up to the suppliers to leverage this new um, channel that's been provided to them to get rid of, you know, excess inventory or actually take advantage of this last-minute 
impulse buying segment of the market. And Lorraine, Norm, how do you think? Yeah, like how do you think, Norm, that you know suppliers should be adjusting their rates across channels? Well, I, I I would characterize the hotel tonight phenomenon, the idea of you know being able to get a lower rate if, as one example of changed consumer behavior enabled by technology. And so I think as we see more dynamic pricing, dynamic bundles coming to the consumer, their behavior may change because they'll see value in some type of bundle offer, especially if it's personalized to the level of, of the individual. Uh, the other factor, as I mentioned earlier, is kind of the untethering of the experience. I think from all the research that we've done and I've done uh, for other clients is a pretty surprising fact that a lot of suppliers don't have, say, tablet-specific applications. And the tablet experience is so immersive and has such an ability to help that planning and dreaming cycle, including booking, that it's a little bit of an uncovered gem. So if you're, if you're dealing with a market globally where tablets are becoming the dominant platform and leapfrogging over desktops, how are you now interpreting the needs of that tablet user? And are, are there new behaviors that will emerge, similar to the last-minute booking on hotels for smartphones, that we're just starting to sense now? And how does that really get influenced by dynamic pricing and bundling? So, uh, you know, particularly hotels who are, you know, they strive toward rate parity, but, you know, at the same time, right, they, the pricing strategies need to differ, we say, across devices and also based on last minute. So and what are some of the challenges there for the, uh, you know, the fragmented hotel marketplace? And who are you asking? <laughs> Whoever wants to answer. <laughs> <laughs> would you like, Vanu, would you like to answer that or you would like me to? Sure. So, um, so Lorraine, I think, um, you know, there is opportunity for a hotel to leverage all these channels that are available. And I think, you know, despite concerns around rate parity, there are ways to actually go around it and do, do value adds. So you might be using, you could be using an opaque channel when necessary, but also bundling up, you know, add-ons and, and, and be offering a different product to the customer based on, again, what segment, what channel you're working in. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's very true, true. And I think the idea of, in particular, bundling and, or, or ancillary bundling from a hotel perspective is a way to add value without necessarily changing the baseline price. So if you receive a message that gives you free Wi-Fi or gives you an upgraded room or some other tangible benefit from the hotel, that could change your behavior and, and create a greater loyalty to, towards the hotel. So it's a, it becomes a tool versus just environment is, oh, well, you have the cheapest price, so we're going to take that. Let's shift on to air because normally you talked about merchandising and ancillaries. And you know, we have a question on the impact on airline IT systems. So what should an airline do to implement dynamic pricing techniques? And you know, and to add on to that, are the GDSs ready? Are they prepared? What types of solutions are they offering for the future? Well, there's no question that merchandising platforms, I mentioned just three as an example before uh, Google, uh, Google's ITA software, uh, Datalex, as well as Fairlogix, all three are selling merchandising platforms to the airlines. The problem with airline systems is you have a lot of individual silos of information, and therefore sometimes you know, the, the, the common thing which I've heard for years is you end up having a bit of a disruption on your flight, you go to a kiosk or you receive a message on your phone and it offers you a pass to the club room, and by the way, you're already a member of the club room. And that type of uh, poor or lack of intelligence is almost like customer ignorance is really a factor of a bunch of different siloed systems not really talking to each other. So that is an effort that the airlines are pursuing. It's the same for the hoteliers in the sense that there's a lot of on-property uh, systems that don't necessarily talk to each other, uh, include, including central reservation systems. So I think what we're moving towards and we're not there yet, is a way to really understand the value of that customer and relate the, um, the types of bundling, the ancillaries that 
to that customer. So there's platforms. But even if you put in a merchandising platform, as I described, you still need the type of infrastructure to determine the true value of the customers because the merchandising just allows you to execute. To know who to execute to at what point in what way requires not only CRM systems, but really this emerging CEM concept, this experience management, where you know what happened at every touch point, and you gather that through really the use of big data techniques to understand what should be offered to that customer at that point in time. So are the GDS is ready or provided? Oh, yes. And, and as far okay. as the GDS, my, my apologies, that was the second part of the question. Uh, the, all three GDSs have mounted pretty uh, intensive efforts for merchandising. Uh, there's obviously some friction between the airlines and the GDS, but in my opinion, both <laughs> But both parties are part of an important ecosystem. We're not going to see 100% distribution directly through supplier sites. We're not going to see uh, some distribution through supplier sites, but you know, still the use of GDS as a, a vehicle for reservations. So what I'm hopeful is that the two will, will merge goals. And as I said, all three of the GDSs have pretty extensive merchandising platforms. The question becomes the users, in other words, the travel agents who use the GDS, will their behavior change to sell value versus simply selling price themselves? Because if bundles or rebundling or if they get the ability to bundle on the desktop, that changes the conversation between the user and the travel agent. Now, in traditional travel agents have done that kind of on a manual basis, you know, talking to someone one-on-one -on -one and thinking, well, which tour uh, package or which elements of a package would be uh, you know, best for that individual. That just gets complicated through technology that the GDSs are mounting right now. I'm going to move on to you know, dynamic pricing and how it might pertain to targeting. So, for example, we all remember, or many of us remember, the famous story where Orbitz was serving up different prices to Mac users versus PC users. And, you know, while it was controversial, it, it naturally seems to be you know, smart to understand who your customer base is, who your customer is, kind of profile them or bucket them and serve up different pricing. So how far is the marketplace doing that? I mean, obviously it is because we saw it in this, in this instance. But, you know, how far along is the market in kind of the travel industry in targeting, A, kind of profiles or B, individuals with specific pricing? Well, we, we saw at the Travel Innovation Summit, one of the winners, uh, Sociomanic, was actually delivering through big data unique ads to individuals based on what their explicit and implicit behavior is. So if ads are being delivered in that way, I think we're getting to the point where customization will really drive some new models in the industry. Uh, the reality always is different than the vision. And the reality today is most of the bundles we see are more along what you just described, more market segment bundling. Here are the different segments out there. Here are different families of, of uh, fares and attributes that go together, and they're probably more, most appropriate to those segments. A lot of that traditional kind of marketing uh, process is still in place. Pricing to the individual is not there yet. And uh, there may be some, someone may prove me wrong that there's some exceptions out there, but if there are, they're pretty spot exceptions. Are we moving to personalized pricing? No question in my mind. So the timing of it is going to take years. A lot of it is behind the scenes infrastructure pulling together these disparate data sources. Uh, a lot will be enabled by big data techniques, but we will get there, and that's going to change the way that price comparison is done in the marketplace. Banu, what are some of the trends you're seeing, particularly in the OTA market? Um, so, Lorraine, as I covered in my presentation earlier as well, I think um, you know it's a it's a competitive competitive world out there, and what we are finding is, you know, there is a bunch of regional OTAs that are coming and gaining a foothold in their specific regions. We see that in, you know, Latin America, there's uh, Despegar, there's Best Day. Uh, we, we, we similarly see that uh, covered about India and China and Japan. So I think one of the things that we're seeing is, you know, local OTAs are becoming stronger. You, you must have also heard about uh, the, the relationship booking did with Elong. So uh, the, the, the deals like that that are happening 
to help get access uh, to local content as well. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. We are out of time. I would like to thank our presenters, Norm Rose, Bonnie Chopra, and particularly Ray Gain, because they made this webinar possible for everyone today. And thank you very much for your time. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.